I'm going to go ahead and get started. Uh, thank you, everybody, for showing up tonight. Got, uh, current students, I've got past students, I've got friends, and we've got guests here. Uh, it's great. This is the fullest this class has been since we've started. Uh, we have a very small class, typically. Um, our guest speaker tonight is Dr. Myrtle Means. Uh, Dr. Means and I went to school together many, many years ago. Not that many years ago. Um, but uh, yes, uh, she's, uh, this is the second time that she is uh, doing a speaking engagement uh, involved with me. The first time was uh, on issues of sexuality and recovery from substance abuse. Uh, and she is a dynamic speaker. She knows her stuff. She is a noted psychologist. She is the author of The Recipe <coughs> for Ecstasy, uh, which I'm sure if you speak to her, you can uh, get copies of. Uh, it's available on Amazon. And uh, I would suggest you all uh, purchase a copy, buy copies for your friends and family. Um, and. Uh, I think that this is going to be a really good class. She's here to speak about uh, sexuality in the confines of uh, relationships, which is a, a very interesting topic for all of us. So I would like to just state that for all the guests uh, and for the actual students of this class, uh, let's please give um, our respect to the instructor in sexuality is sometimes a difficult subject for people to uh, talk about and to listen to. We are all adults in the room, so uh, it doesn't mean you can't laugh and have a good time. It just means that we need to uh, respect the fact that we have somebody who's going to be speaking to us about the subject and conveying some knowledge to us. So without further introduction, I'm going to turn it over to Dr. Myrtle Means. Thank you. I'd like to thank you all for joining us also this evening. I apologize for my tardiness. Um, I am going to talk to you today about sexuality and communication. I will talk to you about it in the context of relationships. But I'm going to start off with a discussion about the foundation in terms of how we learn to talk about sexuality. So as Dr. Park said, you know, sexuality can be a very <coughs> difficult topic to discuss. Um, and I think that how we're introduced to this topic affects how we express it how, and how we experience it. And ideally, our first introduction to sexuality is in a home. It comes from uh, conversations, interactions, and observations within our family, uh, hopefully with the primary caregiver, there are some ongoing discussions. And so if you think about how we should talk about, how we should introduce the topic of sexuality, it's important to know who you're talking to, knowing your audience. You know, when I think about children having age-appropriate discussions from the young child to the school-age child to the adolescent, where sexuality looks differently at all of those stages. And then, of course, you go into having discussions about the young, with the young adult um, oftentimes, there are conversations that have to take place between teachers and students, between professionals, uh, between physicians and their patients, between psychologists and therapists and their clients. So I think it's important for us to know who you're talking to and what their needs are and what their level of understanding is as it pertains to sexuality. Uh, I think it's important to be mindful of sensitivity, some of the morals and values that uh, different people have, their different comfort levels, um, as it relates to communicating within the context of relationships. Problems, preferences are important to be able to discuss, discuss as well as individual characteristics. Things change in our bodies as well as in our minds and preferences when it comes to sexuality. As we get older, as our circumstances change, we go from being single to being married. In my book, The Recipe for Ecstasy, I studied uh, four groups of women, married, single, with and without children, and there were some very distinct differences in uh, what they required for sexual satisfaction and relationship satisfaction based on their age and stage of life. 
and we'll talk some about that. So individual differences absolutely play a role, and effective communication of those individual differences is essential for intimacy, for pleasure, and of course for sexual satisfaction. Do it, don't talk about it. So if you look at media, social media, I mean, you think everybody's doing it, right? Uh, teenagers, it's something that's everywhere. So look at in messages on television, uh, it's on billboards, you see it pretty prevalent in social media. However, research shows us that not a lot of people are actually talking about it. Um, as I mentioned, I think that the foundation is laid at home with our parents. But what research tells us is that often parents don't feel comfortable talking to their children about sex. The ones who do feel comfortable have usually had a conversation themselves when they were coming up. They're more knowledgeable. And oftentimes parents sometimes don't feel like having sexual conversations are appropriate with children. I can give you a personal example because earlier this year, I had a conversation with my daughter. I have three children, three girls, ages 8, 11, and 17. Again, all the very different ages and stages of life, but sexuality is very prevalent in each and every one of their lives. I can see it all the time. I had a, my eight-year-old, when she was five years old, um, she was kissing boys in the mouth of kindergarten, and we had to talk to her about that. <laughs> um, had to show her how to set some boundaries. My, uh, currently, my 10-year-old, she'll be 11 soon, uh, she was, she, her body is changing, it's developing, of course she's uh, prepubescent, and so I thought that it was time for us to have a conversation about sexuality, not that we hadn't been having interactive conversations about it throughout her life, because we, we have, it's just who I am, we're, we're open about the topic, but I thought it was time to have some more detailed conversation, because one of the things that research, research shows us that the conversations are usually a little bit more general as opposed to details. Because of some of her behavior, I thought that it was time. But she told me, no, she wasn't interested. She said, I'm only 10 years old and I don't want to talk about that. And so I respected that. But a couple weeks ago, I was looking at some of her YouTube content and I saw the word sexy and, and I said, I thought you said you weren't interested in talking about sexuality, but I see you looking at certain cartoons, animes, and nothing too explicit, but there's clearly some evidence of curiosity. And I said, so if there's some curiosity, it's time for me to give you some explicit sex education. So I made her read this book. It's perfectly normal. <coughs> You're going to read this book. We're going to talk about it. I want you to tell me if you have any questions. I'm going to tell you what I think is important for you to know. But she was initially resistant to it. But after paying some attention, I knew that it was time. So um, I think paying attention and having those uh, interactive conversations, they're really, they're really important. Oftentimes when parents start to talk to children about sexuality, the focus is on morals and values. I see it a lot in my practice. Uh, people come in with some ideologies based on what the parents have taught them, their religious upbringing, and that is often the focus of parents. Don't do it. Don't do it. Don't bring any kids into the house, but they don't talk about other things that are also very relevant to sexuality, sexually transmitted diseases, the possibility of pregnancy, how to make partner choices, and pleasure, because that's one thing that sex is supposed to be about. It's supposed to be about pleasure. There are a lot of different aspects of sexuality and why people choose to interact with pleasure is a very significant part of it. I think oftentimes parents think that they talk about the pleasure component, then it encourages the behavior. Uh, internet safety, uh, something else I think that's become very uh, relevant in terms of the discussions regarding sexuality and how people go about seeking out partners and communicate. There's a whole different language out there, a language that I'm still learning in terms of some of the abbreviations for sexual terms used on the internet, some of the uh, applications like Growler, Grindr, are you all familiar with those applications? Growler, Grindr, I see smiles. <coughs> I've heard of it. Okay, they're hookup apps, you know, they're applications that people use to tell you how close you can find a sexual partner. There might be someone two miles away who's 
interested in hooking up, and you can find them with your grinder, growler applications. And so this is a whole new way of interacting and communicating about sexuality um, that, again, like I say, I'm still learning uh, quite a bit about. As I mentioned, there are a lot of different contexts in which uh, sexual communication takes place. I talked some about home. Then there's sexuality in the school. That's often uh, one of the, the next stages. There's, in a lot of states, there are sexual education classes. And research shows that while many teachers uh, agree with teaching sex education in class, they don't feel comfortable doing it. They don't feel like they have the knowledge to do it and they don't feel comfortable talking about the topic. Um, and I'm curious, uh, how many of you in here had a sex education class? Oh, like a one-off, or like it was like a class like how this one is? I'm talking about like a junior, junior high, sixth grade, oh, the birds and the bees, the conversation. There was a lot more giggling. Yeah, a lot more giggling. <laughs> OK. How informative was it? Period. Yeah, <laughs> they separated the girls from the guys, at least in my school, yeah. and they focused on us as far as like our periods, like this is about to happen to you, and the boys had their own separate conversation that we weren't privy to. They focused on the biology of it, pretty much. Yeah. Right. They started to tell you about the fantasy, sexual fantasies you might have. Right. Yeah, they, the they focus on the have. fact that once someone something happens to your body, right. they say that that was not it. Pregnant after that, right? Don't do it because you get pregnant. Right. Again, <laughs> some of the common focus, but not again that sexuality can be a very positive part of your adolescence. That it's a very normal part of growing up. That there are interpersonal decisions that have to be made. There are personal decisions that have to be made. Any discussion regarding sexual orientation, sexual identity, when that is, of course, the phase in which this is often happening, people are beginning to really understand and solidify their overall identity, but more importantly, their sexual identity. That's when people get their, they start to really question, you know, who am I attracted to? Who do I want to spend my life with? Who, what type of people am I interested in? What kind of um, sexual interests do I have? They don't discuss that because, again, I think it's because they feel like it will encourage it. But research shows us that actually teenagers are having less sex now than they were, say, five years ago uh, in the context of the young, young teens, 14, 15, 16 years old. They're actually having less sex now, 17, 18, 19. That age group is a bit more sexually active. As a, as a clinician, I feel like I have to be uh, able to discuss many aspects of sexuality. I have treated 11-year-old boys and 80-year-old women. And in that context, from that, that range, every single person that's coming to my office has spoken about sexuality in some things. There's been some, there's been my 11-year-old client, who was a bit freaked out because I was pregnant at the time, like, why are you getting bigger? Why is your belly getting bigger? He did not understand. He made him very anxious. And I had to be the person to talk to him about pregnancy. I've had 80-year-old uh, women who've lost their partners and haven't been sexu sexually active for 20 years and wondering how to go about seeking partners. There's the postmenopausal woman whose body is changing and doesn't quite understand it because when they go to the doctor, it's not something that the doctor has openly discussed. Um, and so I think that as a clinician, I have to be very versed about the topic because it's gonna come up. When I think about uh, the medical profession and sexuality, um, I, I have a lot of clients who suffer from diabetes, the high blood pressure, they've been treated for cancer, uh, many of them are on medication for depression, anxiety, mood disorders, all of these treatments and illnesses affect sexuality, and oftentimes there are no discussions about it. I've had a male client who uh, suffered from prostate cancer um, have a treatment that prohibited him from being able to achieve an erection after being treated for prostate cancer, but it wasn't something 
he was told about before he made the decision to have the treatment. And so he was not well informed. Women who have um, been given, I think the medication is tamoxifen, um, a medication that treats cancer, breast cancer. It uh, suppresses hormones, which affects your sex drive, but no discussions about it, no aware awareness of it, changes in the body. So I think because it's such a difficult um, topic to discuss, uh, we have to make it easier. We have to sort of bring down some of the taboos about it. Uh, that's really important. Uh, sexual dysfunction and disorders, uh, another uh, thing that might be difficult to discuss in the context of relationships. Um, it's often something that brings about a lot of shame. There's not a lot of education about it. We see today a lot of commercials on television, Viagra, Levitra, and they dress it all up and make it look great on the commercials, but it creates a lot of distress for people that makes it difficult um, difficult to discuss, especially in the context of relationships. And I will talk some about how I, um, I treat sexual dysfunctions in my practice because as, as important as I think sexuality is to people, it is so hard to talk about some people, they just avoid it altogether. They avoid talking about it, which means they avoid their partners, they avoid intimacy, and then it leads to other problems like depression anxiety, substance abuse, for example. As Dr. Parks uh, mentioned, we went to graduate school together. I don't know what you remember about our program, but it was a classically analytic program, which means that uh, we talked a lot about Freud and we talked a lot about sex. And so I think our program was unique in that. Many graduate programs um, are, were not like ours. And because my interest was in human sexuality, I often supplemented my education. Whenever we had a presentation to do or research paper to do, for me, the topic was about sexuality. So I can say that I left my program feeling uh, knowledgeable about the subject. However, oftentimes that is not the case. I just taught a human sexuality course at the Michigan School of Professional Psychology where the graduate students in my class were fourth year students working on PsyDs, which means they were at the end of their coursework. It was the first class that they had in their program that addressed human sexuality. And it astounded me. It was the first class. Um, and I used very explicit examples, case examples. It was something that they had not been exposed to. And so what that means is a lot of professionals leave their training programs feeling unprepared, unprepared to deal with um, the problems that some of you might walk into their offices to be treated for. Um, and I think it's, it puts us at a disadvantage, puts our community at a disadvantage. If you remember when I had you come out to speak to the psychologists and, and social workers, uh, in my other place of employment. I remember coming. The purpose of that was be, was simply because of that, because no one professionally addresses sexual issues and handling sexual issues within counseling. So I, I had all kinds of therapists and had been doing therapy for a while, and knowing that sexuality was a huge issue, especially in people who are re recovering from drugs and alcohols. It's a very significant issue, but no one ever taught any of them how to approach those issues or address those issue issues. So your class at that point was one of the first that any of, and these were people who were already working in the field, uh, and that was why I wanted to, to bring you on board in that situation, because I, how do you, how do you address somebody's whole life without talking about sexuality, especially when drugs and alcohol are involved, which often is intertwined with sexual behavior? Of course, sexual choices, um, sexual functioning. I mean, uh, when I think about uh, substance abuse and sexuality, I have many clients who had never had sex sober, right? And so they didn't know how to even approach 
sexuality without drugs and without alcohol. So it's it's such a fundamental piece. And if you, if you look, you know, topics that, you know, mental health professionals need to be able to discuss, but I think these are also topics that individuals need to be able to discuss. I mean, sexuality with children, pregnancy, uh, sexual communication, dysfunction and problems, illness, uh, substance abuse, as he mentioned, uh, safe sex, gender identity, and I think with the internet, that just opens up a whole new world of uh, topics that we're still learning. Um, that we need to talk about. So in the absence of conversations about sexuality, what do we do? We assume. We assume and our behaviors are based on those assumptions and stereotypes. Um, and oftentimes our reliance on stereotypes and assumptions lead to dissatisfaction, specifically in the context of relationships. And some of the assumptions I have listed here, you know, all teenagers are having sex. Well, actually, that's not the case. Like I just told you, research tells us that fewer and fewer teenagers are having sex. That all women can have vaginal orgasm. Just one of the biggest myths I think walked to my, my office about female sexual functioning. My clients believe that there's something wrong with them because they hadn't been able to, to reach a vaginal orgasm. But when I tell them, that is the consistent experience of 80% of women, they are astounded by that. But it's a myth that men prefer large breasts. Well, I got a butt man sitting right there, Mr. Oh. Mr. Muhammad. Uh, men desire sex more often than women. That might be the case based on um, uh, hormones, but I think sexual desire is a very um, that all gay men, men are promiscuous. I've treated many gay males in my practice, and the one consistent thing that they're often looking for is an intimate relationship, and it's one of the most difficult things for them to find, and I think it's because of the stereotype that all gay men are promiscuous, um, that all women desire foreplay. Again, sexuality is a very individual and unique experience, and I think that that's what makes communication so important. People need to talk about their preferences, their problems, their fears, their concerns, so that we don't rely on uh, stereotypes and assumptions to guide our behavior. So with communication, uh, I've come to intimacy, conflict resolution, uh, I think improved technique, understanding in terms of yourself and in terms of your partner. I'm going to talk to you some today about my book, uh, The Recipe for Ecstasy, because um, I looked at these groups of women and they gave me a lot of information about what women desire in terms of sexuality. They communicated to me and so I'm going to communicate it to you. Um, before I get there, um, let's talk about two uh, different pathways of communication. One is the instrumental pathway which communicates our preferences where we can talk about problems, technique, fantasy, which can um, improve the likelihood of satisfaction. If someone knows who you are and what you desire and you're able to ask for it, then that improves the likelihood that you're going to be able to get it. The expressive pathway facilitates intimacy and that's not just expression of your sexual desires, but it's your expression of who you are in general. When I use the word intimacy in my practice, people often think I'm talking about sex. But when I use the word intimacy, I am usually talking about emotional closeness. And while sexuality is one way to achieve emotional closeness, it is not the only way to achieve emotional closeness. Sharing is the one general way of achieving closeness. No matter what you share, some people share common interests. Some people share grief. Some people share in conflict resolution. Some people share in the development of goals. Uh, and some people share their pleasure. I think in, in order to be able to be intimate, especially in the context of a relationship, one of the fundamental uh, ingredients needed is trust. Trust that you can open up, especially when it pertains to sexuality, and there is not going to be any judgment. 
that's where I think personal values and morals into the picture because there are so many discussions today about what we should not do. Things that we should not do. Should not have sex before marriage. Well, what if I don't want to get married? Hmm. Then where does that leave me? Um, until the Supreme Court allowed for gay marriage, what would it have meant for individuals who weren't allowed to be married? That means they're not supposed to ever have sex. When I think about sexuality, I think about it in terms of it being just as basic as eating and sleeping. It's a fundamental physiological need that needs to be met. I was speaking at a conference a couple weeks ago, and I started to do some reading out of one of my books. And it can get pretty explicit, some of my books, some of the narratives, because I took narratives from women who described their most sexually satisfying experiences, and I pulled out the ingredients to the sexual satisfaction. So some of the narratives can be quite explicit. I often try to pick narratives that I think people can tolerate hearing. But I remember having a discussion and the room fell silent. So I knew that they were uncomfortable. I'm pretty good at sensing what's going on in the room. They were really uncomfortable. So I shifted the conversation to eating and sleeping. Then everybody had something to say. I said, well, what happens if you don't eat for a couple days? Or what happens if you don't sleep for a week? What happens if you go without these basic physiological needs? You get irritable. You're mad. You shut down. Can't focus. There's conflict in your relationships. Like, well, that's what happens when you don't have sex, too. You get irritable. You have difficulty focusing. There's conflict in your relationship. They were able to hear that just because it was not about sex. So let me tell you some about, um, some about my research. So what motivated my research uh, was the fact that I was born to a teenage mother. Um, she was 16 when she had me. Um, I grew up on the east side of Detroit. People familiar here with the east side of Detroit? It's a wild place, you know. It's characterized by a low income, crime, violence. And my circumstances were not unique. And so I was curious about how my mother went about choosing her partners, how she chose my father. And then I have three younger siblings who were fathered by uh, a different person, how she chose their father, um, because I was aware that it didn't look like what I had in mind when I thought about <coughs> being in a loving relationship. It just didn't look like that. And this was not the picture I had in mind. And so it motivated me to, to do my research study, which was about sexual relationship satisfaction in women. What are women, uh, what are we looking for? and why and how do we find the partners and so because of our program i was required to do a quantitative piece and a qualitative piece which means there were numbers and there were words i wasn't really interested in the numbers so much but but i'm glad that i did it because it helped me explain some of the findings i found in the narrative so i asked women to tell me in their own words about their most sexually satisfying experiences to give me as much detail as possible. And I had 106 women write narratives. Um, and then they almost split down the middle in terms of being married and single. They were with and without children. I asked them to tell me about the nature of the relationship. Uh, was it casual? Was it a one night stand? Committed? Something long term? Anonymous? Someone he just picked up? Um, one night and had sex with. I also asked if they had uh, considered having children with a person in this situation that they identified as the most sexually satisfying experience. And the reason why I was curious about whether or not they had considered having children with them, because theory would tell us, especially evolutionary theory would tell us that women seek out partners who will commit their resources. Who's satisfied?
Married, single, with and without children. Married with. Married with. So that is what I hypothesize. Again, based on theory, I hypothesize that women who have secured a mate have an intimate, co committed relationship and had the pleasure of giving birth to a child and creating a family would be the most sexually satisfied. They had it all. Why do you say that? Oh, because I am. Ah. <laughs> <laughs> I'm on the floor because I'm seven and a half months in. Ah. So um, for me, I think because I chose my mate, who's actually in the back corner. Um, Congratulations. <laughs> he, I knew he would be the best choice for me because I knew he would be there. And I knew that even on an intimate level, because I love the way you describe intimacy, um, it's more than sex. It's like I feel comfortable and I trust and I can tell him absolutely anything and the fact that I can do that helps me be more secure in the fact that we're bringing a person in this world together. Sounds so, like what many theory, of the women said to me. Right. In that theory, it it works, but in practice. Right. It's probably the whole difference. In story. practice. So are you, you you're married yes. with mm -hmm. a child? This is number two. That's number two. Okay. So any other takers in the room? What do you think? I'm going to say married with time. Tell me why. Too. The intimacy of the relationship, they're able to do more. You know, they can go on the vacations and have more intimate memories okay. and connection without having the little ones next to you at all times. Because it does, it does get shrinking at times. Okay. You know, because they're literally constantly just, they're up on the end. Right. Can't go to bathroom without <laughs> knocking, asking. Trust me, I understand. <laughs> children mostly satisfied, when you added children to the equation, they went from first to last. Last. And so it wasn't so surprising to me 10 years later when I looked at the data and started writing the book. But based on theory, when I did the research, which I was a single woman who didn't have any kids, it's when I did the hypothesis is based on theory, and so I was really dumbfounded by that. How do you go from first to last? Now that I'm a mother, I get it. I get how you go from first to last. But what was even more curious to me was that single women with children were second. Even above single women without children, and above married women with children. So I'm thinking, now how could single women with children be more sexually satisfied than a married woman with children? I mean, a single woman, she doesn't have a helpmate, she's busy, she doesn't have a consistent sexual partner. Any idea how a single woman with children could be more sexually satisfied than a married woman with children, or a single woman without children. Freedom. She didn't have that much freedom. She has a kid. The single woman has the most freedom. Because most most men will most men that just want a one time deal don't want to go for a woman that's that has children. So the men that see that accept it, they're more gratifying. The ones who will they, yeah, they'll, they'll they'll seek them out. Yeah, that is a piece um, of gratitude. Acceptance. It's a good idea. Anybody else? Because single women with kids know how to take care of everything themselves. Mm -hmm. Well, one, it's all in, in that line because one of the things they're taking care of is their sensuality. Right. 
And that's what it's about. It's about my sexual pleasure. I don't have time for anything else. So I need to find someone who's going to give me what I need, when I need it, and leave so I can continue taking care of my business. The focus is on pleasure. That group of women were more interested in things like newness. That's one of the ingredients to the recipe for ecstasy. Variety, one of the, the ingredients to the recipe for ecstasy. They were more arousal. The in the moment variables that were more associated with pleasure, solely pleasure. Married women have expectations. They want you to do laundry first, right? That you put the kids to bed. I'm tired. How well are we getting along? Single women with kids, we don't have to get along. You just have to show up, give me some sexual pleasure, and leave. You don't even have to worry about the laundry. I'll take care of that in a second. So the difference is in expectation. Because married women, their list was a little different. They were worried about the mood. So you said the mood? Was it a safe mood? Was it playful and romantic? Did you invest some time in trying to get me ready? What was the setting like? These are the kind of things they were talking about. What was that like? What was the nature of the relationship like? How were we getting along? Were we in this committed, loving relationship or not? And so the differences in expectation help to explain why single women and married women had such big differences. And the thing that I talk about in my book is that the single woman should probably take a few pages from the married woman's book, and the married woman should probably take a few pages from the single woman's book. For the married woman to be able to focus on her pleasure, to be able to relax a little, not worry so much about all the expectations, and for the single woman to focus more on the nature of the relationship, acquiring intimacy, love, because those are some of the ingredients that were on the list for the married woman, more about the nature of the relationship. So as I talk about these different groups, it's important to understand that our needs are different because we are different, right? We are different as it relates to our own individuality. We are different as it relates to our age and stage of life. And that brings up the idea of separateness. You know, I talk a great deal in my book about being able to hold on to who you are in the context of an intimate relationship. Oftentimes when I treat couples, I want to see them separately for a few sessions because I want to know who you were before you got married. Let's talk about that. Let's talk about who you were before you got married and what you brought into this relationship, your baggage, as well as your assets. Let's try and understand that. And so being separate is one of the things that increases the, the need for effective communication. That's why you need to talk about it because what I want, you might not want. And how I think we should get there, you might have another idea about how we should get there. And so separateness often brings about the conflict as well. When people want different things sexually, how do you negotiate that space? You talk about it. You talk about what your needs are. You talk about what your preferences are. You share your fantasies. You talk about your body and how it responds or doesn't respond. Um, I can't tell you um, how many people have told me in, in their relationships that they not talk to their partner about pain during, sexual, during the, the sexual act. Like, well, why doesn't your partner know that you're in pain? Why didn't you tell them that? Or I'm not comfortable with a certain sexual behavior, haven't been able to, to say that. Why have you compromised that? Why have you been, not been able to share because they don't think it's appropriate? But when you can appreciate the, uh, the, the importance of separateness and being able to hold on to your own unique self, especially as it relates to expressing your sexuality, then you become more comfortable talking about who you are and what you like and what you don't like and what makes you uncomfortable and what your fantasies are. Another reason why being able to um, communicate effectively is important because people often for different reasons. 
And some people are trying to have sex to make babies. Others are trying to have sex to feel a sense of esteem, some confidence, feel loved and desired. Another um, ingredient that was in the recipe for ecstasy uh, was engendered feelings. How did your partner make you feel? And a lot of women talked about having a positive self-concept. I felt loved. I felt beautiful. I felt cared for. I felt desired. I felt sexy. A lot of people use sexuality for those purposes when they're interacting. And then, of course, pleasure. And of course, if you're in pain or having problems and there's some dysfunction in sexuality, it isn't very pleasurable. And so we should be able to talk about that. And lastly, uh, relationship closeness and satisfaction. Before I go on, I'm just curious, are there any questions? I've said a lot. Um, any questions? No? How's your about? I don't know. Say that again. How's your about? So like how like you said the whole like married couple thing, mm -hmm. like they have kids and then like the most satisfied is when they don't have kids. Yes. And it's because they're more sexually active, like I think. Oh absolutely then, they're more I mean even like going back, you know, B C time, you know, the mother gives birth to the child, the father, they get vengeance. I think that has like a lot to do with it too, you know what I mean? Because the wife's not seeking out pleasure or Or you know focus I mean? is somewhere else. The focus is now on because they almost feel like neglected. Right, absolutely. But there's a, there is a transition period. I think you have to be willing to adapt. So in the context of a family, there are different units. There are the, the family itself, right, where everybody's involved. But then there's the marriage, where kids, they don't, that's, that's a different unit, yeah. right? There are the individual relationships with the children. What happens often is that the, fam the, the family unit becomes everything. When I asked my couple once, the last time you went on a vacation, I'm like, we took the kids to Disneyland. I'm like, no, I'm not talking about taking the kids to Disneyland. When the last time you and your spouse were alone without your children, where you could focus on pleasure, when's the last time that happened? We've never done that. Oh, it's been since our honeymoon. So part of it is that the focus, there's a different, there's a different shift. I mean, there's a lot to do. How many people in here have kids? Ah, right. So you all don't know yet. There's so also, there's also a difference between parents and then there's also special needs parents as well. You know, because a special need parent, they have to do more, and there's no time for just your relationship. We have a five-year-old that's autistic, and it's go go go. So I have a special needs child as well. There are appointments, three steps. OT, yes. physical therapy, <laughs> doctor's appointments, neurologist, yes. absolutely. Um, so not only as it relates to having uh, children with special needs, um, age and stage of life. So as you get older, there's something else going on. Somebody else is getting older. Your parents are getting older. And so then there's, I'm taking care of kids. I'm seeing about my parents. I have a job. I have a house. I have kids I have to put through college, I'm preparing for retirement. Sexuality often takes a back seat to all of those things. When it should be one of the things that helps you get through some of those things. It should be a source of pleasure that you rely on for comfort and coping to be able to step away from all of the realities of life and enjoy the partner. Mm -hmm interested to know if um, there were age differences. Was that, a, was that a confounding variable of that? It was not. Age, race, education, and did a covariate analysis. It was not. Curious enough, it was not. It's, it's, that's odd because, you know, I, I think that in my own life, all the things that I've, I've run into, all the things that you talk about, which is marriage and, and kids, have run run into marriage twice now um, and divorce. Um, but uh, the, I think that there's a point, and many people my age as well, and I'm the oldest person in here. Um, the um, you start to reach a point, 
my age where you're kind of reevaluating all of the mistakes that have occurred because mistakes occur in life and it and it, at 50 and above I notice that the people that I know when we talk about sexuality know so much more about handling it and being satisfied with it and looking for satisfaction they, just because they have the experience of probably being dissatisfied many times and realizing why they were dissatisfied. I just find that, that even with the, the clients that I see, the same type of thing, that it becomes an issue that asserts itself throughout your life no matter what. It's interesting you say that. I mean, it's because as we get older, our bodies also change, right? So you all are far away from this time. But, you know, the levels of hormones as they deplete as we get older. So while some of our knowledge is better, even like say by 50, 60, your kids are grown now and they're out of the home. And so even if you are married with children and you're in your 50s, they're off living their own lives. So you should have the opportunity to focus solely on pleasure and you should have some experience and understanding about how your body works and what brings you pleasure. But at the same time, you're going through menopause or menopause. It's what's happening. I mean, so when you hit 50 and women, the average age of menopause is 51, and you know what the consequences of menopause is for a woman? You know, besides brittle bones, crankiness, <laughs> crankiness, right? Hot flashes, maybe some depression, anxiety. Vaginal dryness, the thinning of the vaginal wall, difficulty with the physiological arousal, making it through the stages of the sexual response cycle. You all familiar with the sexual response cycle? So that excitement phase and that plateau phase, the body isn't responding in the same way. The vagina isn't lubricating as well. It isn't expanding. The, the wall is thinner. And the same is true for men. The erection isn't as firm. Sometimes it's hard to maintain. Um, the refractory period, which is the period once a man has an orgasm, the period between when he can get aroused again to reach another orgasm, the refractory period becomes longer. So when you're 20 and you're a man and you are engaged in sexual interactions and you have an orgasm, <coughs> for some, five minutes, you're ready. You could. Have sex again, maybe 15, 30 minutes. Well, for some men, it's hours. What about days before you're able to achieve an erection again? And so it's interesting that um, I, I didn't get it, the uh, saying, you know, youth is wasted on the young. <laughs> you know, but we get all this knowledge when we get older, but our bodies have changed. And so we have to change along with them. Um, so we have to adapt. Um, which means that as you get older, again, I think about some of the values and morals that people have as it relates to um, using sexual accessories, is what I call them. You know, so you need to get some lubrication. You might need to buy some toys that help to facilitate arousal. Um, use uh, external stimuli to help excite you. I just had a conversation with a couple last night about um, painful intercourse and they're probably in their late 50s. Um, well the wife has a vibrator. She uses it all the time on herself. Not once has she introduced it into the sexual relationship with her husband. He knows she has it but they don't use it together. But when they have sex she's not aroused. I'm like well why don't you use a vibrator? I mean, they use lubricant. I'm like, well, that's going to facilitate wetness, but only for so long. If she's not feeling excited, the lubrication essentially <coughs> is just going to dry up as a result of friction. Her body hasn't exp expanded to accommodate a penis. She's not excited. Uh, you all have to work on that. Her body is changing. It's, she's not 22. She's in her late 50s. <coughs> but they don't talk about it. It's something she does in private. 
And so we had a conversation about what kinds of things they might need to add to the to their pantry, kind of ingredients. You know, you might need some erotic material. Have you ever? I know people have different feelings about pornography, and so I always talk about erotic material in a general sense. There's all sorts of erotic material. There's erotic books and magazines. Have you ever read it to each other? Have you ever read erotic stories to each other? Have you ever shared your sexual fantasies as a source of excitement? Um, mutual uh, play uh, before intercourse with toys, sensual massage? <coughs> no. And not tried any of those things. They just went boss and lubricant. And so, being able to keep in mind how the body is changing and what you need to do to to kind of accommodate those changes is really important. So, the slide that I have up about the three different types of sexual arousal, I think, fits well into the discussion because it's about how uh, we might use different ways to find arousal. So, the the partner interactive style, it's, it's more active. It's in two people using each other, their interaction, their communication, sexual talk, with your eyes open, touching, this mutuality. Uh, and most often men are uh, more active with this type of arousal style. Let's get engaged. Their men are more, tend to be more visual than women. Um, men also tend to have a bottom-up process when it comes to sexual arousal. Starts in their genitals and then it works their way up in terms of being close. This is a common source of conflict between often couples between men and women because women have a top-down process. Women always say, I want you to stimulate my mind. I want you to, I want to feel close. And if you're not feeling close, if you're not sharing things, then it might be difficult uh, to achieve arousal. Women are more likely to be self-focused, using a, a self-entransment, thinking about how things feel, more about maybe even sometimes in their mind in terms of their fantasies. Um, and then there's role enactment, which I consider to be variety when I think about the recipe for ecstasy. Uh, fantasy, role play, experimentation, like I said, I suggested to the uh, couple last night that you might need to Experiment a little. You might need to add some accessories to facilitate arousal based on the, um, the changes in your body. Um, the other thing which astounds me, um, and I don't know if you found this in your practice, uh, but it's really hard to get clients to do homework when it comes to sexuality, and I don't get it, uh, but they, they struggle with it. So I ask, so have you been doing your exercises? Which I always talk about exercises. There's always homework to be done to, to maintain sexual health. I know, it doesn't even come to mind. Are you familiar with the kegeling, kegel exercises? Yes. Yes. <laughs> right. So, kegel exercises is one, it's one exercise that will help to maintain sexual health, but also help to give sexual um, control for both men and women. It's often uh, recommended for women who have had children uh, because it helps to, to tighten the, the walls of the vagina. So I'm going to tell you a little bit about how you do cable exercises. You all probably, maybe you'll recognize it when I talk to you about it. But it is the exercising of what is called the pubococcygeus muscle, PC for short. Sound familiar to anybody? Exercising the PC muscle. So how you find the PC muscle is that you stop and start urine in midstream. That's how you find it. That's how women and men find the PC muscle. And tightening and releasing the muscle over time, you do it just like you would if you were exercising at the gym. You do three sets of 10 reps two or three times a day. I often tell my clients to connect it to something that they do regularly so that they don't forget. Do your KO exercise on the way to and from work. Do your KO exercises while you're opening your mail. Do your KO exercises if you're on your tablet, in your Facebook. Find something to coordinate your KO exercise with so that you don't forget. But somehow, every time I ask, 
they've forgotten to do their Kegel exercises. But it is, this exercise is something that is done to strengthen the muscles. It gives men greater control over their uh, orgasmic response. So sometimes it can help with uh, premature ejaculation. Because when you exercise, what happens? What happens when we exercise our muscles? Say I'm lifting to buff up my biceps. What happens when we exercise? They grow. They grow. What, you know, the physiological process? Stronger. Stronger? Absolutely. It's stronger. Endorphins. Endorphins? Absolutely. Blood's pumping. Blood gets pumping to the area when you exercise, right? So if you're exercising the PC muscle, blood goes to the area. And what facilitates the arousal process? Blood. Dr. Means is available for speaking engagements. Her contact information is as follows.